What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the Fake HQ, the dungeon. I am joined with Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you're following both of us to talk about trade targets. This is week five, about to be week five. We are a quarter of the way through the fantasy football season, assuming your championship is in week 16, like a normal person. And each week we come to you on Wednesday morning with some buy low trade targets, some sell high trade targets, depending on rest of season schedule, things that happened in the previous week, guys coming off big games, guys coming off fraudulent games. That's what we're here for. We're here to feed y'all the big facts. Make sure that if you enjoy the video, you enjoy the big facts, you smash that thumbs up button. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. If you're new, we're doing fantasy football content six days a week, something like that, maybe four, maybe five. I'm not really sure. I'm not too good at counting, but I know uh, that we're doing a lot of it and we're doing a lot of good content for y'all. If you want some exclusive content, you can find that at patreon.com slash BDGE, where you will get access to the waiver wire exclusive article that dropped this morning or yesterday morning, private live stream every Saturday, our weekly rankings and a private community slash forum where you can ask all your fantasy football questions for the week. Noah, how are we doing? We're about to fucking talk some trade targets. Yeah, that's what it's looking like. <laughs> Hopefully they work out better than Nick Chubb and all the other guys we recommended in the past. And, you know, Derrick Henry had 100 yards, so not much is looking up, but we'll bounce back. It was, it was a bad week for us, but I think we had some good weeks prior to that, so they can let us slide for half a minute, although we might have lost them their league if they actually traded Nick Chubb last week. Um, but we got to stand by our words, and yeah. we're about to stand by our hatred for Todd Gurley, which continues into the season. Talk on Todd. Well, first I want to talk about hitting the intro. <laughs> God, I got him. <laughs> Damn, I'm I, I was like, I was so hoping you went right into it. God damn it. I'm so pissed. All right, we're starting with Todd Gurley. He's a sell-high candidate, running back for the Los Angeles Rams. And the reason for this is he's coming off a decent game. He didn't really put up too many yards on the ground, but that's kind of to be expected with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense at this point. Uh, he scored two touchdowns, but you look at his usage this year, and I know he's a guy that, like, nobody was really high on heading into this season. Like, if his knee didn't have arthritis and he wasn't, like, an unknown commodity in, like, the injury area or whatever, uh, he would have easily been, like, a top-four pick. And now that he's not hurt and he's getting this usage, people are starting to kind of like favor him a little bit and see him as like a top 12 running back. But I think last week was a little bit of like a facade, if that's even how you use the word. Uh, he saw 11 targets. Fugazi. Fugazi. I like that better. It's a little more, <laughs> it's a little more on brand. Uh, his 11 targets last week was easily the most he's seen this, uh, thus far. He topped out at four before this. But the interesting thing to note is Jared Goff threw the ball 68 times. And 11 divided by 16, I'm no math major, but I do have a calculator. And that's a 16% target share. Last season... Is an accounting considered math? It's business. You're like literally a fucking math major. Get, well, get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to drop out before I get the degree, so it doesn't matter. Uh, big summer plans. Big summer 2020 <laughs> coming at the big dogs. Let's go. Uh, so we already kind of saw his peak in terms of market share this season, topping out at 16% through four weeks. Last season, his market share for the entire year through his 14 games he played was 16%. And these running backs that we view as top 12 guys, as people that have high ceiling and high floors, they're guys that can score touchdowns. And not only that, they get usage in the passing game. And that's not something we've come to expect out of Todd Gurley through four weeks. I know McVay said he wants to get him used a little bit more, but how many times are they going to be throwing 68, like they're going to have 68 passing plays per game? And how many times is Todd Gurley going to be like third on the team in targets behind you know, those three elite receivers and even Gerald ever getting usage. Um, so along with that, like, lower ceiling for receptions, his touchdown numbers are a bit concerning to go forward predictive-wise because I know he scored three thus far, but last week his 13-yard touchdown was actually the eighth longest touchdown run of his career, and he makes his bread inside the five-yard line, and 69% of his rushing touchdowns throughout his entire career came inside the five. This season, he only has two rushes inside that area of the field, so... If he's not getting those rushes in that area of the field, and we saw in the beginning of the season, Malcolm Brown kind of took over that role. Um, he hasn't really had that role since then. But if the opportunities aren't there for him in this area of the field, what can we really expect as a touchdown ceiling for Todd Gurley? He's a guy that, you know, he was getting like near 20, 20 plus touchdowns a season. And if that's not in the cards for him, along with like his health concerns, along with his knee, uh, 
there's not much that I wouldn't sell him for that's like an RB2 at this point. Like a Chris Carson, I'd flip for him right now. Austin Eckler is pushing it. Like I pulled off a trade with our boy Scott. Uh, I was about to him, say, didn't you just uh, – or someone in one of my leagues just did a yeah. Chris Carson for Todd Gurley. Was, yes, I gave Scott Todd Gurley and he traded him away. But in my deal, even when Melvin Gordon came back, I gave him Christian Kirk, who's now injured, and uh, Todd Gurley for Austin Eckler and Tyler Boyd. And I think a package like that where you can get a guy who maybe has like the same weekly floor as Todd Gurley, maybe not the upside, and get another piece just based off name value alone is a good trade to make, especially looking at his schedule upcoming. And I know it's not like – extremely difficult and you guys in the twitch stream can't see it but it'll be up in the video um but a lot of these defenses like seattle san francisco is like ranked number one they've only played three games but just watching them play they're really like a tenacious run defense um even atlanta they haven't allowed many points like a lot of these games aren't favorable especially during the playoff time weeks 13 through 16 when you're trying to make that final push it's arizona seattle at dallas and san francisco those are games where you're probably going to start him just based off name value if he's if he's even healthy by that point and those aren't games where you're going to expect like a high ceiling points wise out of him. And because of that, I'm going to try to trade him. Maybe if you want to wait a few weeks and like for Cincinnati and Pittsburgh for him to have a big game and then move him there. Um, but he's just not a guy I expect to be an RB one or even like a high end two for the rest of the season. Yeah. Make sure you change that chart. FP's allowed to uh, uh, running back. Yeah. Running back. Yeah. I mean, just touching on Todd Gurley. I mean, coming off this game, he put up the fantasy points, but he literally got fucking five carries scored on two of them. And, that's not something that we're going to be able to see week over week. That's if he's even getting those goal line carries. And you, I see here like the rushing pace for the year, 196 for 876 uh, rushing yards, 44 catches for 248 receiving yards and zero touchdowns. So it's like you don't know what you're even going to get from Gurley on a week-to-week basis. Like I, you barely feel comfortable throwing him into the RB2 mix right now because a lot of the time, I mean, he might look fine in person, but there will be probably four to five more games throughout the rest of the year where he goes 14 carries for 85 yards. And you're like, oh, that's efficient. That's fine. But that's not good for fantasy, especially not where you drafted him. So I'm all in on um, trading away Todd Gurley. And it's funny because, like, the reason we wanted to get rid of him in the summer and not draft him in the first place in the summer was because we were worried his knee was going to flare up. That hasn't even entered the conversation yet. Obviously, they're worried about the knee considering, um, you know, his usage right now. And they're like, oh, we want to get him 25 carries a game or whatever. They give him five carries going off of the target share that you said, you know, 11, 11 receptions, but it was on 68 pass attempts. So you got to cut those numbers down and ratio them out to what a normal game is going to look like. That was the first time he was actually involved in the passing game all year. So, you know, how often are we going to see games like that? I, I don't think that's something that uh, we're going to see very often. Now, staying within the running back position, on the flip side, there's a guy in the Chicago Bears who a lot of people were, you know, He had this week one where he barely touched the ball. He wasn't involved. He looked pretty good. And everyone's like, oh, my God, they're not using him. Matt Nagy is not using him how he should be using him. And since week one has happened, David Montgomery has gotten a ton of opportunities. And we most recently saw – I didn't actually see what happened with Mike Davis. I know he was a healthy scratch. I don't know behind the scenes what was going on with him or, you know, if there was something in his family or something. But he was a healthy scratch. He didn't end up playing this last week, which is good news for David Montgomery because it seems like, you know, they want to give him as many carries or as many opportunities as he can get. And these tweets from Jared Smola that you'll see on the screen uh, per Draft Sharks, look at his snap rates week by week, 38%, 45%, 65%, 69%. His opportunities, which are carries plus targets, 7, 21, 16, 26. The guy is getting all the touches he can handle, right? People complain about the, the touches that he didn't get, but he's getting plenty of them. And usually volume will turn into, um, fantasy production. So from weeks two to four, you see those 21, 16, 26 opportunities. He ranks seventh in the NFL among all running backs in terms of opportunities. He's getting 21 opportunities per game. Now, I don't know if you would consider this a negative or a positive at this point, to be honest, but Mitchell Trubisky is dealing with a dislocated left shoulder and a slight labrum tear. Um, He should be back sooner rather than later, but he is almost definitely not going to be playing Week five, they have a bye week six, so maybe he'll be back then. But I would assume that if Trubisky's out, they're going to rely on David Montgomery in like a very, very heavy fashion. So we have Chase Daniel taking over. Um, They play against the Raiders, which is obviously a plus matchup for running back, David Montgomery. So I like what we're seeing from the volume opportunity standpoint, right? You see these other rookie running backs, such as like Miles Sanders, who is still in a timeshare. And we kind of always thought that 
uh, David Montgomery was going to be in a timeshare for the beginning of the season, but he got out of that really quickly. He's already getting those 20 opportunities per game that we wanted to see. Maybe he hasn't looked as good or as efficient as we had, uh, would have liked to have seen up to this point, but I think the volume will eventually turn into production and uh, David Montgomery will you know, be an RB2 on a weekly basis sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's all you can hope for out of a running back is opportunity, and that's what he's getting. And it's not even just in the rushing game. It's in the passing game too. So that brings like that extra value in those PPR formats. And a lot of people really soured on him because he was like a breakout candidate to start the year. And he started off on like a slow – he had a slow start. So uh, people might want to get rid of him, especially with Mitchell Trubisky out, which I'm not sure that really hurts him. They may be a little more conservative and run the ball a bit more. And that narrative of like uh, a mobile QB helping the running back, it's not like Mitchell Trubisky's running all that much this year. So that's not really something that was lost with the injury of Mitchell Trubisky moving to Chase Daniel. So, yeah, as you said, like it's a good defense. They're going to pound the rock. Um, he seems to be the favorite now. He's been getting like 60% of the uh, work in the backfield. Mike Davis is out. Yeah, he's a guy that, like even for Todd Gurley, you can flip probably Todd Gurley for David Montgomery and another piece. And that's something I would definitely do because I don't see too much of a difference between those two players. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you actually, Gurley or Montgomery rest of season. I would, that's really close. I would actually probably lean towards Gurley just because I trust the offense a lot more and I'd rather have a quarterback and a head coach that actually knows what the fuck they're doing. So I'd probably lean Gurley, but it's a lot closer than um, than most people probably think. Yeah, I think their floors are kind of similar. I think Gurley's ceiling, as long as he stays healthy, is a little bit higher because of the offense and because of the scoring opportunities that they're possibly going to be in in comparison to Chicago. But yeah, he's going to be somebody that we've seen getting, like we've seen him get 20 touches a game. I wouldn't be surprised if he's just like averages like 18 touches the rest of the season and that's easily running back two numbers. Yeah, for sure. Another guy who's eating on volume, he's about to see more because of an injury. It's Lair Fitzgerald, wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals, and he's a buy low for me. Um, like he's on a ridiculous pace right now. He's on pace for 92 catches, 1,200 yards, and eight touchdowns. But he's had two kind of like low-end games these past two weeks. Uh, Yardage-wise, he did score a touchdown in one of them. But the reason I'm buying in on him, and I'll talk about the schedule later, but he's been used all over the field and used so heavily, not only in the context of this offense, but like among the league as a whole. Uh, he has the fifth most red zone targets in the NFL, the most inside the 10, the 19th most deep targets, the sixth most deep receptions. So he's getting these valuable chunk plays. He's getting these looks inside valuable areas, inside the red zone, inside the 10 zone. Uh, and this is an offense that they're not going to stop throwing the ball because, one, they can't run block, and I guess they can't pass block either, but they can't run the ball at all with David Johnson because I guess Mike McCoy is just back in town running up the middle like 25 times a game. And their defense cannot stop anybody. So all they're doing is throwing the ball. Uh, Kyler is eighth in air yards thus far this season uh, among the entire league. And Arizona is fourth in pass attempts. So. That's not something that's going to slow down anytime soon, uh, especially with, you know, the division they're in, like the Rams and Seattle and San Francisco not being afraid and having the ability to put up points. They're going to be playing from behind. They're going to have to throw. And, you know, even though they are playing from behind and their defense stinks, it's not like the time of possession is a huge factor just because they're running so many plays. And the plays that they do run, like those short dump offs, those work directly in Larry Fitzgerald's favor because when he's not working deep down the field those couple times a game, he's the main slot guy for – Kyler Murray to dump the ball off to and we've seen that thus far just you know I already brought up the pace but a guy who's on pace for 90 receptions is basically like Jarvis Landry with touchdown upside that we saw in like Miami and that's like a back end wide receiver one and taking that into context and just looking at his schedule upcoming there's a lot of green in there and the only red you see is San Francisco and then weeks 15 and 16 but San Francisco has played only three games and on a point per game basis to the wide receiver position they've allowed the 12th most points so there's really not a game up until week 15 or maybe after their bye in week 12. So week 13 through 16 where they get any tough opponents. And with Christian Kirk now down for, I don't know how long I saw, I think either two to six weeks or four to six weeks. Um, so basically like right up until the bye, uh, he's going to be getting good matchups and he's gonna be the number one receiver on a team that's throwing the ball a ton. He's gonna be a volume hog. If you're in a PPR league, I don't see how, like how he finishes outside of the top 12 receivers cumulatively through those couple weeks up until they're by. Um, and even rest of season, like this is a team that's going to throw the ball so much that matchups don't really matter as much as they would if like it was Minnesota and the volume isn't there and uh, the limit opportunity leads to them not having that high upset. Yeah, I think what we're dealing with with Christian Kirk is possibly a high ankle sprain. And for people not named Saquon Barkley, that's usually a four to six week uh, timetable to return, possibly even longer. But I'm not sure if we've actually got official word on that. 
Um, and I'm also, I'm not sure how easy it'll be to pry Larry Fitzgerald away from the owner because, you know, when you draft a guy in like the 10th round or so and he produces like Fitz has been producing, you know, you might have to pay up a little more. That being said, though, Fitz is a guy that I would, I would pay his price for. I don't even think you need to buy low on him. I think like if you want to do a, a straight swap for someone that's, uh, that's around the same value or even, you know, even lose the trade just to make sure your lineup's a little better. I'm okay with that because Fitz has been an absolute beast. Like you said, like, I mean, he's a slot receiver, but at the same time, he's tied for the NFL lead in catches of 40 plus yards. That was the entire number that the Cardinals team had last year. They had four catches of 40 plus yards. He already has four himself this year. And when you're a slot receiver, that's ridiculous. And like you said, I mean, they are first in the NFL in terms of pace. They are running um, the, like the second most plays right now just because your offense doesn't have the ball as much. But in terms of how many, how many plays are running like per minute, they're number one in the NFL. And when you're a slot guy, volume is king. So even on the, uh, on the games where he's not getting those like 40-yard plus passes, you can basically pencil him in for 12, 12 targets a game while Christian Kirk is out. So um, I love this call with Larry Fitz. I think, you know, I mean, he's obviously lost a little bit of explosiveness, but he seems like every bit of Larry Fitz that we've gotten used to while he's got a – normal quarterback in there so I'm uh, I'm on board with Larry Fitz for sure yeah I'm trying to think of like receivers that you could flip one for one I know Adam Thielen has probably fallen off a bit like value wise uh I would flip. I would I would take Fitz over Adam Thielen right what now what about Tyler Lockett I think that's a pretty close one that's close I would take Lockett there for sure though I would as well just because Lockett's getting too many targets from from Russell Wilson right now I think and I uh, watched like the coaches film on uh, game pass and there were so many times that if Russell Wilson just looked his way a split second earlier like yeah. this past game he could have had like 300 yards there were so many like double moves and co uh, cover two defense where he just went right up the seam those could have been like broken off pretty big and there was a few that Russell Wilson was a little bit late on but they still completed the pass I think he's got such high upside in this offense but yeah Larry Fitzgerald is just me one of the highest floor wide receivers you can get at this point. And the ceiling is still there because he's their biggest receiver in the red zone. And he's the guy that Kyler Murray is looking to. Yeah. I love Larry Fitz here. Um, so leading to uh, a little super flex action, we don't give enough love to the quarterbacks here. And this is another trade target. I don't even know if I want to use him as a sell high, but I feel like it's just someone we need to talk about. And it's Deshaun Watson of the Houston Texans. Now I'm in almost, yeah, I'm only in super flex leagues this year. And uh, I own Deshaun Watson in two of the three seasonal leagues that I have. And it's been fucking horrible owning him because he hasn't, he's had a big game or two, but he's looked horrible if you've watched him play. This offense is horrendous. Like they have Deshaun Watson, they have DeAndre Hopkins, they have Will Fuller, but yet they want to run the offense through fucking Carlos Hyde. And I don't understand it. The problem is though, like when, even when Deshaun Watson is passing the ball, he like looks terrible, man. He looks shaky in the pocket. He's holding onto the ball for like way too long. And I don't want to hear excuses about like DeAndre Hopkins not being able to get open because he's fucking DeAndre Hopkins. When he's not open, he's open. And the volume has sunk down. Like without Carlos Hyde, I mean, with Carlos Hyde there, they're running the ball more than they ever have. Um, he hasn't attempted more than 34 passes in a game yet this year. Last year, he attempted 35 or more passes in 44% of his games. So he's not getting the volume from a passing standpoint. He's saved a couple of his fantasy days. And by saved, I mean like, got you to 11 or 12 fantasy points because he got in the end zone from a rushing touchdown. But things have looked horrible there in Houston. The offensive line, like, yes, they've theoretically added these pieces and it's supposed to be improved, but they're still, still very much a work in progress. And I have a bunch of numbers here about, like, dropbacks and pressure and stuff. He's been pressured on 73 dropbacks, which is the second highest number in the NFL behind Kyler. He's taken 18 sacks, which is also second behind Kyler. 32 hits taken is number one amongst quarterbacks. Last year, the Texans allowed an NFL high 62 sacks. Right now, they're on pace for 72 sacks allowed. That number has not been hit since the Raiders did it in 2006. So the production is a concern. That's one piece of my concern with Deshaun Watson. But he's also a guy who's missed a lot of time throughout his career with different injuries. And the fact that he is getting hit at such a high rate makes me nervous. Like I don't even know if he's going to get through the season without getting hurt with the number of hits he's taken. So – I would say it's a mixture of both the offensive line, which is definitely improved. They are giving him more time in the pocket, but he's holding onto the ball for way too long. And I just, something just looks off when you watch him play. And it's just like, uh, I don't know what's going on here. What I will say is I don't know if I'm necessarily looking to sell Deshaun Watson right now. They play the Falcons at home in week five. So if there's ever going to be a get right game for Watson and DeAndre Hopkins and stuff, um, this is going to be it. This should be a big game for Texans offense, but I wouldn't be opposed to selling him after he has this big game. 
obviously, I mean, in one quarterback leagues, I don't know how high the price is going to be. Like if you're even going to be able to sell a quarterback, but in super flex leagues, you should, you could probably end up getting a big return. Like maybe um, see, package Deshaun Watson with another player and see if you can upgrade a, Like see if you can even grab Mahomes from somebody Watson plus like a wide receiver two or some shit like that. If Mahomes has another down game, it's, I don't even know if it's possible to buy low on uh, fucking Patrick Mahomes at any point in his career. But if there's going to be a, a shot to upgrade, it's probably Deshaun Watson coming off of a big game. And that's probably what's going to happen with uh, Atlanta. Yeah, as you said, this offense has looked awful. Like, against the Chargers, I think they put up, like, 20 of their 27 points in the second half. Like, they couldn't get anything going, and the Chargers are as depleted as they come defensively. Against Jacksonville, I think they put up, like, 13 points. They barely won. Last week, they put up 10 points. Like, it's not looking good for Houston. And as you said, like, Deshaun Watson is still that big-name guy that you probably have the ability to flip him in, like, a wide receiver, too, and maybe convince a guy to give you Mahomes. I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but uh, maybe if you, like, upgrade that wide receiver, two to something else, he will. As you said, it's just like he looks nervous back there. And I think in week one, he took like a pretty big hit on a run he was trying to score on. And he was like on the ground for a while. And I'm not sure if that like brought back memories of his ACL. But like we saw last year when Carson Wentz was like afraid to run, he just didn't look confident back there. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing out of Deshaun Watson, which kind of hurts his rushing upside. And yeah, he scored a few rushing touchdowns, but the rushing floor yardage wise really hasn't been there. So if you like, if you take out his rushing scores, I don't know where he would rank on the season points wise. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's, like, outside the top 20 and, like, close to QB 25. Um, I'm sure – like, I'll look that up and I'll put it on the screen right now for the actual video. But, yeah, this this offense isn't one I'm completely buying into. And if you can sell him after the Atlanta game where I know their defense is almost as depleted as the Chargers, um, I'd look into doing that for not, like, a bad quarterback or, like, a middling, like, QB 2. Like, he's still going to be a QB 1 just because he is Deshaun Watson. I expect him to get back. But – uh, yeah, he's not a guy that I expect to be the QB2 that we all thought he was going to be heading into the season. And just speaking of, like, the pressure that he's facing, like, at this point, I don't see, like, too huge of a discrepancy between him and Kyler Murray. Like, both offenses are struggling. Kyler Murray has been showing he can run the ball, and both are facing a lot of pressure uh, because of their terrible offensive lines. Like, I wouldn't hate flipping Deshaun Watson for a Kyler Murray. We just saw the Arizona Cardinals schedule upcoming. Like, Deshaun Watson for Kyler Murray and another piece if you're lacking somewhere else, like, wide receiver-wise or running back-wise. All right, you ready? Well, you're going to know the answer just by the way I'm wording this, but who has more rushing yards this year, Gardner Minshew or Deshaun Watson? Deshaun Watson. No, it's Gardner Minshew. He's oh, 82 no. to 75. <laughs> yeah. who, who, who has more passing touchdowns this year, fucking Marcus Mariota or Deshaun Watson? <laughs> Doesn't he have seven? He has, like, seven and zero picks. He has seven – Passing touchdowns, Sean Watson has six. And he has five fewer passing yards than Sean Watson. Like, his passing numbers are the same thing as Marcus Mariota. He has, like, 50 less rushing yards than Marcus Mariota. And Gardner Minshew has more rushing yards than him. So, like, Sean Watson is just – he's just not getting it done right now. And when I look at it, it's not like he, – he's missing a lot of receivers, like, on, on terms of on throws. Like, he missed Will Fuller for, like, a 70-yard touchdown and DeAndre Hopkins on a, another big game. But, like, at some point, through four fucking games, you have to connect on one of those. Like, he's just missing them weekly yeah. every single time. And The issue is if you, keep, if you keep missing them, and, like, through 16 weeks, you missed all of them. And like, the opportunity was there, but you didn't capitalize on anything. Yeah, it's like get it done or, or you're not the elite fantasy quarterback that we need you for. And uh, just the amount of hits he's taking is fucking terrifying me as a fantasy owner. Every time he gets hit, I'm like, holy shit, this is it. He's done. Because right now, like, you could still squeeze a lot of value out of Deshaun Watson. But every time he gets hit, I'm like, oh, my God, there goes, like, my – lottery ticket per se um in terms of like trade value so i'm probably gonna send out a few offers after this video and see if i can you know maybe downgrade at quarterback but get another piece um in the trade yeah and lastly josh gordon wide receiver new england patriots and he's a buy low for me kind of in the same sense as larry fitzgerald like he hasn't been awful this year but you can probably pay like a little bit lower than his actual value at this point just because he's coming off a bad week against what looks to be probably the first or second best defense in the league in, Bo in Buffalo uh, this season. But you look at his usage over the past couple of weeks, his snap share has went up from 67 and 79% in the first two weeks to 88 and 89%. Uh, he's seen 18 targets over the past two weeks. And I know James White didn't play in one of them, but he still saw seven targets against a Buffalo team that makes pretty much every offense go to the run game because they can't throw. And even Tom Brady didn't look great against them. And just, Basically, in every receiving category, Josh Gordon is number two on this team. And being the number two receiver on the Patriots, like he's number two in air yards and uh, receptions or receiving yards by like only five behind uh, Julian Edelman. Uh, I think I said air yards, like end zone targets, red zone targets, uh, deep targets. 
if you're the number two target on a Tom Brady led offense facing the schedule that he's going to face against Washington, the Jets, Giants, Cleveland, Baltimore, Philly, like there's so much green on this chart up until week 12 with all those things working in his favor. I wouldn't be surprised if from here on out, he's like a wider wide receiver too for the rest of the season where people were kind of ranking him heading into the season when we found out he was going to be playing again because behind him, behind Edelman, behind like Dorsett is inconsistent and James White, like this is an offense that wants to throw and it's not like there are too many targets for them to like not all get fed. Um, and we've seen them win games by 30 points and win games by 40 points and they're still ninth in pass attempts in the league. So the volume is there. The great offense that is the Patriots is there. Uh, red zone opportunities can be there. He's just, he's getting fed. And I think it's only a matter of time before he finally breaks out and is that top 24 receiver that everybody was expecting uh, to begin the year. Yeah. I mean, they've had literally no success running the ball. Like they can't get anything going on the ground. So in these games where they're not playing Buffalo, they're just going to keep airing it out with Tom Brady. And this is a good call because Gordon was someone that like completely fell off my radar just because of the lack of production that he's pretty much had this year. Um, I mean, he's had one game where he hit 83 yards. I mean, he's had one, one game over three receptions, which is a little bit concerning, but it's like when you actually take it into context, I mean, he played Pitt week one, three for 73 and a touchdown. Next week was Miami where they won 43 to nothing, didn't have to use them. Um, next week was against the Jets. He went six for 83. And then last week was Buffalo, where it was a very tough matchup, of course. So it's like you can kind of, I don't want to say right off all four games because you do want to see the production, but there are reasons why he either wasn't used heavily in those games or um, we just saw a lack of production for those games just because of such a tough matchup where they got up in terms of like game script and stuff. So Gordon is definitely a guy that you could probably buy low on because the production hasn't been there. So people like myself kind of um, forgot about him. and He kind of falls off of the radar. Another guy that's probably fallen off your radar. And I actually brought him up in our trade target video, I think two weeks ago. I just want to touch on real quickly is Robbie Anderson of the New York Jets. Now, I don't really know what's going on with Sam Darnold right now, uh, if he's going to play or not. The reports were basically saying that he was going to play. And then I was listening to a podcast today that had negative reports about him. And they're like, if he's not 100% ready to go, they're not going to start him. So it's possible that he's not good to go against Philadelphia this week. If he is, though, this is a, a pretty big blow off spot for Robbie Anderson because we saw the Packers absolutely dominate the Eagles secondary on Thursday night football last week. They made them look like a fucking high school team. And I know like Darnold, you know, even at like 80% could probably take advantage of these cornerbacks in Philadelphia. Um, hopefully they don't trade for Jalen Ramsey. And if they don't like, that's going to be one of the worst secondaries in the league for probably the entire year. We saw what happened last year. They were an absolute defense to attack when, once they started losing um, all their players to injuries and stuff. So this could be a very big week for uh, Robbie Anderson if Darnold is back, if he's not, you know, it'll end up being a tough matchup just because he doesn't have a quarterback. And then he's got like two or three tough matchups in a row. But then starting in like week nine, I don't have the schedule up right now. I got it right now if you want me to go through it. It's yeah, starting week nine and go to like 14. At Dolphins, Giants, at Redskins, Raiders, at Bengals, Dolphins, Ravens, who have been terrible this year, and then the Steelers. So he doesn't really face a good defense until the Steelers in week 16. Yeah, exactly. And that's your fantasy championship. And like those, the, even before Baltimore, like those five or six games in a row are against legitimately the worst passing defenses in the NFL. So by that time, by week eight or week nine or whatever, like Sam Darnold is going to be fine. That offense should be clicking a little bit more with all their pieces back together. And Robbie Anderson comes back as like, we saw him dominate towards the end of last year when Darnold started clicking, when he started getting into his own, a lot of it was going to Robbie Anderson. He was a guy that was, you know, stepping up big time in the playoffs for a lot of people. So I think that everyone's so down on Anderson just because of how the shaky start to the season began for the Jets. Um, and Darnold obviously missing time. And Robbie Anderson coming into the year with the calf injury. He's had some tough matchups already. Um, but he's got a Buffalo game behind him. He's got some of the tougher matchups. He's got like Stephon Gilmore and the Patriots behind him right now. Obviously, they play him again. But getting one of them already in the past and not having that on the future schedule is, you know, is great for Robbie Anderson. So I think um, matchups are going to get easier. I think uh, the offense will start clicking a little bit more. And now is probably the time to buy Robbie Anderson for the very, very cheap price yeah. you could possibly get him for. And if he does happen to blow up this game, I think his price will like astronomically like skyrocket. If that's yeah. worded correctly, just because Philadelphia, we all know is a terrible defense, but they don't have a quarterback. And if Luke Falk, if he's the one who's going to be starting is shows connection and shows rapport with him coming out of the bye against an Eagles team. Um, then people will be like, oh, maybe they don't need Sam Darnold to come back. And they'll write off these next three games against the Cowboys, Patriots, and Jaguars and be like, oh, I see this slate upcoming. I'll just put him on my bench these next three weeks. And then no matter if it's Sam Darnold or Luke Falk at quarterback, over those next like six, seven, eight weeks, 
Uh, I can actually plug and play him as like a wide receiver three or flex option. So buying him ahead of this Eagles game where you probably don't even expect him to do too, do too well and you can stash him on your bench is pretty much like the smartest play you can make because his value is low as is. And you know these upcoming matchups are going to be tough, but then from week nine through the rest of the season pretty much, he's going to be a guy that you can probably rely on as a flex option when Sam Darnold is back. Yeah, someone that you should sell for Rob Anderson right now is Jordan Howard, running back for Philadelphia Eagles. Coming off this big game, three-touchdown game against the Packers, who have a horrible run defense, I want to first uh, say that. Um, Jordan Howard, still on the year, is far behind Miles Sanders in snaps. He's getting like 30% of the snaps compared to around 41% for Sanders. This is absolutely a running back by committee, and it's not going to be any players in that committee that you can actually trust on a weekly basis. I think none of them are more than desperate flex plays at this point. I still much rather own Miles Sanders because I think he's just looked far better. Um, and I think eventually he'll get things going if he could stop phone mobile and stuff. But on a weekly basis, you know, you're never going to be able to trust Jordan Howard. He'll have, sure, he'll, like next week he's going to go 14 for 41 without scoring a touchdown. And they're going to be like, fuck, this is the Jordan Howard we knew that we had the entire time. So coming off a three-touchdown game, especially the fact that it was on like live television and everybody watched it on Thursday Night Football, they're seeing Jordan Howard like, oh, he's the lead back. But that's only been the case for one game, right? They're going to ride the hot hand. That's just the way Doug Peterson and his running back by committees work. So ride him for that game, trade him for next week. Robbie Anderson, Jordan Howard, make that move right now. Yeah, we talked about it in week one, or at least I did, and you weren't completely on board with it. But like selling Allen Robinson after a Thursday night game because everybody saw it in that observation bias of like, oh, I saw him, he's dominant. Whereas like most of these games you're not watching on Sunday unless it's like your favorite team. So we saw Jordan Howard look good, and he was actually catching passes and running pretty well. You can use that because, like, everybody saw, obviously, it was a primetime game. Use that to flip him for a guy, like, sell low or sell high. But, like, you can lose a little value based on what Jordan Howard just did because you know from here the rest of the season you're probably never going to start Jordan Howard. He's not going to be a guy you can rely on. And you can flip him for a guy like Robbie Anderson, who you know maybe down the stretch you, he can actually make your roster instead of Jordan Howard, who's going to be sitting there and wasting away the value that he got for this one week before he just loses it all. Yeah, Jordan Howard's fool's gold. Fool's gold. This shit is real gold. 24 carat. What Delaney Walker said, they are who we thought they were. They will run this running back by committee until the year 3000. Yes, and it's devastating as a Miles Sanders owner. But um, I think that's all we got for trade targets today. If you're watching this on YouTube, we live stream this every week on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Fantasy. And after the video, we'll take some Q&As. We're live right now. So we're going to hop over to the Twitch chat take some Q&A video or take some Q&As from the video stream um, and answer them. So if you want to, you know, jump over there to twitch.tv slash big dogs fantasy, you'll see us answer some Q&As over there. But that's it for today's YouTube video. Make sure you smash the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. If you found it informational, make sure you're following both of us on the Twitter. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, you can join us tomorrow for our video with Dr. Jesse Morse going over all of the key injuries for fantasy football for week five. And you can head over to patreon.com slash BDGE for more exclusive content, waiver wire, weekly rankings, private live streams, all that kind of shit. Patreon.com slash BDGE. YouTube, we're out. Goodbye.